verse, starting at chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit the seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. And if you would join me in our Psalter lesson, it is Psalm 130, and we'll read the entire psalm. <laughs> Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, I hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? That there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his world I go. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all iniquities. And our gospel lesson comes from the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. The word of our Lord. Okay, well, we'll Trev, we're going to forego the children's sermon because uh, I don't want the other kids getting jealous that he got one just by himself. Okay, <laughs> oh, and good morning. Good morning. And good morning to all of our friends, and visitors, and family, and everybody else here. Which we will deal with you in due time, and you'll get yours. But before we go any further, as is my custom, I would like to pray that the Lord's inspiration would be upon me so that I can deliver the word of God to you. And if you would, just pause for a moment as I ask the Lord to help both of us. Dear Lord, bless us with ears to hear and me with a mouth to speak thy word. May the words of my mouth, through the inspiration of your spirit, the meditations of my heart, also through the inspiration of your spirit, be acceptable in thy sight. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name, whom we all say, Amen. Okay, now, we have a crowd here, besides Trev, that is young people and well, I'm not going to look at anybody when they say this. <clears throat> not so young people. How's that? Not so young people. And if I were to say to the not so young people, you load 16 tons, then what do you get? Another day more and a day for a day. All right. Any of you young people know that? Never heard it before, right? Am I right? Huh? Come on. Tennessee Ernie Ford. Tennessee Ernie Ford. What a voice. Okay. Now, young people, I'd like to give you a song that you could fill in the rest of the verses, but I tried and tried and tried and I couldn't find any that uh, I could share at church. <laughs> you know, I'm kidding. What I'm saying is, now this is, you look at my title of the message, it says the ultimate lesson. Why does it say that? Well, we know who's here. Okay. But let me just explain to you why I did this. 
You learned a lesson through Tennessee Ernie Ford and the media, well, however it was, whether you bought it, and we used to listen to records, guys, younger folks. I know the vinyl's cool again, but we used to listen to it, you know, on a record player. We saw it on TV, old Tennessee. He told us in that deep bass, baritone, I don't know, music people, which one does he have? It's a low, low voice. That when you work, doesn't matter if you load 16 tons of coal or steel or whatever it is that you're loading, all you get is another day older and deeper in debt. The song goes on and on and teaches us many lessons which you and I both learned. We didn't need to go to school for that. We picked it up on the streets, just like you young people. All the lessons that you've learned in school they're good, some of them, most of them, hopefully. And you know which ones to filter out, I'm sure. But there's another school. The old timers call it the school of hard knocks. Coming up the hard way, life on the streets. Today it's, uh, well, I'm dating myself even when I say this, it's street cred, that's, that's even old. Man, I'm getting old. The new sayings are old sayings by the time I get around to them. What in the world am I talking about? Well. Paul writes to these people in Corinth, let me explain this to you. <clears throat> it's the Las Vegas of its day, wild, open city, sin city. And he tells them, I know it's hard for you to hold on, but here's a lesson you've got to learn. And then he lays it out for them. He says, I reckon, I love that, it sounds like the Beverly Hillbillies. I reckon that these sufferings that you and I have, trying to walk a straight line, trying to do the good thing, Try to be a person of integrity, character, in a world full of <laughs> characters, for sure. People of not good intentions. I realize that causes you suffering, but I reckon that those sufferings are nothing compared to what's waiting for you, especially on the other side. Now, young people aren't gonna jump up for joy I just basically inferred your demise. To be more specific, I, I'm talking about the afterlife. And how do you get to the afterlife? First, you gotta, you gotta pass. Oh, well, I'm passing all my courses and passed, and I got my, no, 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 you gotta die. Oh, I don't want any of that. Well, what I'm telling you, young and old, is that's what waits us all. Why? Because every one of us is in the school of love. And you are going to learn, no matter who you are, the ultimate lesson of life. And what is that? Here it comes. Do you know what, besides the fact that we're going to honor our graduates, do you know what today is? Anybody? Me day. Good for you. God bless you. Good America. June the 6th, 1944. D-Day. What that means is that on this day, 77 years ago, the Allied forces, consisting of the armies of the United States, Great Britain, Canada, and believe it or not, a Polish contingent, got in a bunch of ships, sailed across the English Channel, and invaded Hitler's Europe on the shores of Normandy, France. Now, I'm going to give you a lesson from this. I want you to listen. The Germans weren't stupid. They knew it was coming. So they built a series of what they considered impregnable pillboxes. Solid steel and concrete with huge guns to blast out toward the ocean or any invading amphibious force. They ringed an area that basically stretched from the Netherlands all the way down to the very tip and end of where France ends. And they called it the Atlantic Wall. And so it was. To gain entrance to that continent for the Allies and to put Hitler in his place to stop the Second World War, we needed to invade across the English Channel, which is a very, you know, as things go, and 
in terms of big uh, bodies of water, it's, it's small, it's, it's narrow. Oh, it's many miles, but it's still a hop, skip, and a jump compared to the Atlantic or the Pacific. But what happened? We knew that we had to do it. They knew we were going to do it. There, see, what's, what's the lesson? We both knew, we both had studied. Now comes the test. What do you do when you're under the gun? You gotta remember all this stuff and you gotta put it down on paper and oh, your grades are gonna reflect this. Is it gonna be an A or an F? Which would have been terrible, a failure on the beaches of Normandy. Well, what we did was, here's this, listen. We took our best fighting general. Do you remember who he was? General George. Yeah, I heard somebody say that. That's right, George F. Patton. Tank commander of the Third Army, the fighter. And we stuck him at the place closest to the other side in France called Calais. So we stuck him there. Well, did that get the attention of the Nazis? They put their best man at the place closest to our shore. <laughs> Where are you going to put all your troops now? And to just seal the deal, the Allies gave him an army. And you know what it was full of? And uh, yeah, you know this. Inflatable tanks. Inflatable airplanes. It was a fake army that was full of blimps and inflatable, almost like bouncy ball toys that we used to, as kids, jump on. And from the air, it looked real. Yeah. You couldn't tell the difference. This is before satellites and no spy technology we have today. And so they said, this is where the Allies are going to attack. And of course, we attacked in the exact opposite place. Now, the lesson gets deeper. First of all, what's that lesson? <laughs> Sometimes you have to lead with what's not your best response. You have to show something other than what is not necessarily your true intentions, but what's not your strength. So you guys who made it through, you spent all those years in education, you didn't like it all, I know you didn't. But you went along and persevered. And you made it. Lesson number one. You don't like it? Well, keep on keeping on. Persevere. Number two. Nobody realized was the other general who was on the side of the Nazis who was facing our generals, and we thought, oh, I'm sorry, they thought General Patton, which was false, his name was Aaron Rommel. He was known as the Desert oh, I know, Fox because of his great generalship in North Africa. Well, he was so good, they moved him up to the Atlantic Wall, and they said, he's going to keep us safe. You know, by coincidence, his wife's birthday happened to fall on June 6th, 1944. And on that day, early in the morning, he got into a car and drove all the way from France to Germany so he could be with his lovely wife and celebrate her birthday and be absent from the battle. Coincidence? I think not. Lesson? Uh -huh. On the heels of that coincidence, the Fuhrer himself, the leader who had taken control of the entire army and by fiat and by his executive orders said that you can go here and go there and don't go there and do this, initiate a battle or don't, had told everyone that he could not be awakened before 11 o'clock in the morning. The first troops were hitting the beaches of Normandy well before 6 a.m. He couldn't be wakened until 11 to respond to it. Coincidence? Maybe hand of God. So you had an absentee general and a madman dictator. And what did you have to the average German soldier? You had a guy who was in a pillbox made of concrete and steel with a huge gun to shoot bang bang all of the invaders. And he looked at 5 a.m. as the sun 
It was just starting to clear the fog, and he saw on the horizon, imagine this, 6,500 warships. 875 tenders for those warships, and a total, he didn't know this, but a total of 157,000 personnel ready to rush those beaches. And he rung up, he had to crank in those days, he rung up the phone and he called headquarters and he said, there's thousands upon thousands of ships that are invading. You know what they told him? Go back to sleep. Sleep it off, you're obviously drunk. One of the commanders said, there's not that many ships in the sea. But there were. Another lesson. Sometimes you do your best. And you're going to find this out, younger people. Because us older people have already been through a lot of it. And no matter of your best intentions, people are not going to believe you and they're not going to assist you. And in this case, thank God for it. But it's a lesson nonetheless. Learn it. And remember that life is full of disappointments as well as triumphs. And thank God that in this case, good triumph over evil. But it wasn't easy, you see, because it was fraught with mistakes, which brings us to our next point. You know, Paul said that our sufferings are not worthy to be compared to what waits for us in God's arms. And a lot of these soldiers were about to meet that God. And sometimes it occurred because of mistakes. The Canadians and the British and the Polish, and I do not mean to denigrate their experience and their effort, but they had a much easier time. The American forces, through a number of things, both chosen as well as mistaken, ended up in the wheat grinder, as they call it, and faced an incredibly difficult situation of getting off a boat and running on a beach through the water with 65 pounds of material on your back and being shot at. Many didn't make it even to the shore. Mistakes abounded, tanks sunk with everyone in. They landed. And in some of the beaches, you had Omaha, Gold, and Juno, and some of the beaches, there were sheer rock cliff walls. Why? Because they drifted down to the wrong part. And what did they do? They said to the Army Rangers, climb it. But we're being shot at. That's right. You just keep climbing until one of you gets over there and takes care of business. You want to talk about perseverance, stick to itiveness, and the belief in the righteousness of your cause? There you have it in a nutshell. And they did so. We lost a lot of men well over 7,000 outright dead, and many more casualties. When you hear the word casualties, you're talking about wounded, but a lot of those guys never make it. They die days later or whatever, so we had tremendous losses in the tens of thousands. But we established a toehold, a toehold in Europe, and it wasn't even a year later, remember, the Germans surrendered formally, May 8th, 1945, this is June 6th, 1944. It wasn't quite a year later. Hitler's lying dead in his bunker on April 30th. The Allies had already poured into Paris and liberated it. What's the lesson there? How about for someone who didn't make it and their family that had to reckon with their loss? What's the lesson? The lesson is that sometimes there are endeavors that are bigger than you me. Sometimes there's a job that has to be done that, by the sheer magnitude of it, calls for our sacrifice, and in these gentlemen's cases, the ultimate sacrifice. Sometimes life is just too big, and it swallows us. I don't mean to put fear into you, especially you young graduates, but I do want to tell you this. You're going into a world where faith is going to become increasingly important to you because you're going to recognize there are no money-back guarantees. You're not going to be able to, at one point or another, run back to mommy and daddy. And as the years roll by, you'll find yourself increasingly on your own two feet. And you'll stand. But you'll only stand because of what you learned and how you put it into practice. If you want someone else to carry you, go right ahead. The welfare rolls are full of people, some deserving and some cruising, and you know it, and I know it. You don't want to be one of those that has to rely 
on the impersonal government bureaucracy to carry you through. You've got your own two feet, all that you learn, the dignity that resides in you as a child of God. And you spend all this time on an education. For God's sake, go do something with it. And as for us who are a little older, and some of us say, my time is done. No, it isn't. You wouldn't be here if your time was done. You still have something to do. You still have to get up, face the day, put your best effort on, get that face out of the jar that sits by the door, and put it on. Whatever you got to do, do it while there's breath in your lungs. What happened at Normandy was they established essentially a pipeline from the free world to that which was under the domination of the Nazi tyranny. And they were able to pipe through material and men and confront the Nazi menace. It wasn't like it was all over after that. It got worse. You may, some of you have heard of the Battle of the Bulge. And we had lots of other days to come. Very difficult. But in the end, the job was done and freedom persevered over tyranny. Now, it's always a mixed bag. We know that in the East there were other things going on and freedom didn't exactly embrace the Poles, the Czechs, Romanians, Bulgarians, Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians. I could go on and on because the communist iron curtain fell over them. But even so, in a longer range game, even that came down. What I'm telling you is the final lesson. You think you've seen it all, but you haven't. Even those of us who are maybe older than you, we haven't seen it all. There's more to come. One day, you are going to see something that will, but you won't be wearing socks, but that will knock your socks off. You'll be in the presence of the Lord. And then, you will live an entirely different and higher life in any experience of the Spirit. But until then, don't worry about that. Until then, you have to take, just like I do, all those lessons that were taught to me through the examples of what happens to you. Turn all of those lemons into lemonade, as they say, and make a sweet drink of your life. It's not gonna be easy, no one ever said it would. But it's gonna work. We're here to help you, your loved ones and family. And you know what? Don't forget, you have an advocate in heaven. Not only Jesus, the mediator between God and man, but the Holy Spirit in your heart. Don't neglect that just for being cool or being in style. Heck, like I told you, I couldn't even think of some songs to tell you. Why? Because it comes and goes. It passes. Just like your youth will. Just like your style and your culture will. But you'll still be you. You'll still be here. You'll still need help. Who are you going to call? I swear, somebody say Ghostbusters. I'm coming down from this platform. I'm going to throw up. You're going to... There's a ghost in there, yes, yeah, the Holy Ghost. But you're going to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ to get you through. I'm done. Because from here on in, I'm meddling. But I'm telling you, when the scriptures speak to us, Listen, life is rough, but there is much better to come. And you're in the middle of preparing for it. I don't care how old you are. And so with that, I would like the congregation to rise. We have our affirmation of faith. Take your bulletin with you as you get up. Or if you cannot, please stay seated. But nonetheless, whether seated or standing, in our faith, we know these things to be true. Together, let us say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the living.
the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Now, hymn number 482, you're going to have to help me, someone in the congregation, or all of you, to start it out and to sing it on the right key. Come on, Caruso's out there. Let's do it. Because we are virtual, I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit about each, each one of the graduates. But if you are here today, when I read your name, I'd like you to come down front. There's a mic next to you. To your left. This one working? Can you hear me better now? Oh, perfect. Good. Okay. Um, Zachary Anderson is the son of Rachel and John Zenobi. He graduated from Duquesne University. He received a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry the minor in mathematics. Dr. Stephen Moon, the son of Bruce and Karen Moon, graduate, grandson of Russ and Penny Moon, recently completed his PhD in music at the University of Pittsburgh. Stephen was a Fulbright fellow in, fellow in Istanbul, Turkey, where he did his research on Turkish classical music. Dakota Blevins, come on down. You're my first witness here. <laughs> my first contestant. <laughs> Dakota is the son of Tina and Eric Levins, grandson of Russ and Penny Moon, and has graduated from Bell Vernon Area High School. He played saxophone with the jazz band, concert band, and symphonic band, as well as lead electric guitar in the BBH High School Marching Band. I really hope he decides to stay in music, because he's wonderful. Yeah. Come stay here, stay here. Oh. Come on, you. Buza is the uh, granddaughter of Alan and Debbie Buza. She'll be graduating from Bell Vernon Area High School, pursuing a career as a hospital foreman in the United States Navy. Sarah Hewitt is the daughter of our new secretary, Terry and Tom Hewitt, graduating from Bell Vernon High School. She'll be attending Westmoreland Community College in the fall for liberal arts. 
Morgan Pedizzi is graduating from Belvern and Area High School, pursuing a career in physical assistant, physi me, physician's assistant at Duquesne University, trying for a very competitive five-year bachelor's to master's program. Sarah Lynn Risky, come on down. Sarah is the daughter of Dan and Sherry Risky of Charleroi. She graduated from the Mon Valley, High School, Mon Valley School in Jefferson Hills and plans to work in, pre in preschool and daycare. She loves music and horseback riding and has a wonderful voice. <laughs> Ashley Salembo is the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Ken Salembo, graduating from Rainfold High School. She'll be attending the Kentucky University of Kentucky in the fall. And Ava Zenobi, she is the son of Rachel and John Zenobi, graduated Bell Vernon High School. She'll be attending Barlow University in the fall, where she will pursue a master's degree in four years, criminal psychology through Carlo's three-in-one master's program. Do we have another round of applause for her? Okay. Huh? 
How they treating you there, buddy? <laughs> All right. We also have prayer requests that Bill uh, has given me, so uh, with that in mind, and if there's no other announcements, let's go to the Lord. Lord, as your people, we lift up these requests unto thee. We ask for your blessings upon John and Peggy and Vernon. We pray for Mary Ann who is sick. And we ask, Lord, that your hand of comfort would be upon her, as well as Myrtle and her family. We pray for Barb, oh God. We lift up Iris and Bonnie and Chris unto thee. May your blessings be upon Janet and Melinda and Alicia and Joe, our organist. God bless you for a new life in Olivia. Strengthen and bless this child, we pray. And for Diane Morgan and Linda Nelson, we also lift up them unto thee, O God. And we pray for our graduates. We pray for each other. So now we come into this time where, and friends, I know that it's uh, on the other side of your bulletin, if you would, we come in the time where we pray together as the Lord taught us to. Page four of your bulletin, you will find this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, my friends. I would like to come to the time of the Lord's table. And with these words, commence what we call communion. Some people call it the Eucharist, which means thankful, thankfulness. Some people say the Lord's Supper. I say the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Lord, we thank you so much. Your son has sacrificed his only body and blood while he was on this earth for us. As in another lesson, another example, there is more going on to life than meets the eyes of So as the angels round about you sing, holy, 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 Join them, those who forever sing the glory of your name, and the people's response will be. Let us proclaim the mystery of the faith. So we ask by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would come into our hearts, sup with us this day as we identify with you in this Holy Communion, the Lord's body and blood. And the people say, Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took this bread, which is really looking like a good piece of bread here, by the way. And uh, in his day, I mean, this is, this is good stuff. In his day, they had a flat pita, and it wasn't even necessarily made of all wheat. They would scour the poor, Jesus' people, would scour the land for things like bark off of trees, anything else that they could make filler with. And then they would beat it until it became a flat piece of what we would consider almost like pita bread. Or if it was old enough, it would get that consistency of matzo, as you, some of you may know. God bless you hands that made this bread. But also remember, Jesus and his disciples had this, the wine, 
and a cup of <laughs> meat juice that somebody else had the meat. Not them. He broke this bread nonetheless and gave thanks for it both before and after the meal. And he said, this is my body. And they looked at him like he had seven heads. Because this is a piece of bread. But he said this symbolically. He said, this, which took so much time and effort and care and love, and is made of imperfections, but when rolled together with that love is the perfect sacrifice for you. This is my body. Take and eat. And I encourage each one of you to do so now. Once again, as I said, at the beginning of each meal, there was a cup poured with blessings, and at the end of each meal, there also was a cup. And in this cup, at the time when Jesus made this pronouncement, he was hours away from the fulfillment of what he said about this cup. This cup, which contains the red wine that we see, which by the way was hardly any more alcoholic than <laughs> this grape juice. This was, people didn't drink the water back then, believe me. It was contaminated. They drank grape juice that got a little bit fermented. He said, this is my blood. Hours away from that becoming a reality as he was being beaten during what we call the passion of Christ. His trial, his torture even before the cross, and he said, take this and drink. For this is what the new covenant or agreement or contract between humanity and God is made out of, my blood. And so for you who are his disciples, I encourage you, take and drink. Let us pray. Holy God, you have brought us to this place and time, and not by accident. Holy God, you have filled us with your presence by thy divine will. So knowing this, we thank you, and we pray that from this moment on, we walk out of here, we walk with thee. This is our earnest desire for anyone who can say these words. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, Joe, let her rip. We got blessed be the tie that binds.
that may stay that way through thick and thin, through learning and through lessons, and that the God of all peace would just settle your heart in the love of Christ Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. God bless you, and have a great day in Jesus Christ.